All right, in this video, we're going to go over how you would actually calculate Tukey's HSD as a post hoc test following up a significant one way ANOVA. So, if you're not familiar with one way ANOVA, go back, watch the other video that came immediately before this. Um, so, we're working with this hypothetical experiment with three conditions people are taking a driving test with no phone, a handheld phone, or a hands free set. And we got a significant result in our ANOVA telling us that at least one of the means was different from another one, but we don't know which pair of means is different. It could just be one pair, it could be two pairs, it could be all three of the means are different from each other. So now we have to go about actually figuring this out. Now, Tukey's HSD or Tukey's honestly significant difference is one common route to do this. It's not too conservative, it's not too liberal, meaning it's not too um, statistically under or overpowered and adequately correct. So it's kind of like a Goldilocks test that's one of the most common and best post hoc tests that there are. And it has the added advantage of that it's pretty simple. It's ultimately just another t-test. So Q is the letter given for Tukey's HSD in this case and when we look at that test statistic it is really the mean of sample 1 minus the mean of sample 2 divided by the square root of the MS within from our ANOVA divided by the size of the sample. It has ultimately a null hypothesis which states that the mean, or excuse me, the population mean that sample one came from is equal to the mean of the population that sample two came from. And the alternative hypothesis says they're not equal. Now, if this looks a lot like a t-test, it's because it really is a t-test. You're just using a different value here that's been corrected so to speak, and you're using MS within to stand in for, the for standard error. And to really drive this home, if we were to actually look at a t-test, what we're looking at, specifically a between groups t-test, we have a mean difference divided by a standard error. We're using MS within because it's essentially variance, but it's now based on three groups as opposed to two, and so it's more accurate. And even if we look at the null and alternative hypothesis for a t-test, it looks exactly the same as two keys. We're just doing another t-test, but now we'll need to do it comparing no phone to handheld, no phone to hands-free, and then hands-free to handheld. So we'll have to go through each and do all three of those different t-tests. Now, we're going to do it the more difficult way to start out because it really illustrates how a Tukey's HSD test works. You would still state your hypotheses, which I'll do real quick as we already know what they are. They are equal. They are not equal we would still then go about setting our rejection criteria where we would draw out our little distribution we would look up a critical value which is two tailed and get two different critical regions Now, if you go to a statistical table in the back of a book, you would then go about looking it up. Well, now, when we think, now when we think about Tukey's HSD, there are two numbers that we'll actually look up our critical value based on. K, the number of treatments, which in this case is three, and then the degrees of freedom in the air term. 
So if you were to go to the back of the book and looked it up, you'd find that the critical value for an alpha of 0.05 is 3.77. So you have 3.77 for your upper critical value and negative 3.77 for your lower critical value. So if the test statistic we calculate falls inside of either of these regions, then we would go about rejecting that null hypothesis. We would then calculate our test stat, which in this case would be Q obtained is equal to the mean of sample 1 minus the mean of sample 2 divided by the square root of MS within divided by our sample size. And we could go about figuring this out. We're going to assign M1 to the no phone condition, which had a mean of 4, and then M2 the handheld condition, which had a mean of 1, and then divide that by our MS within of 1.33, repeating, divided by our sample size of 5. Then we could go about just essentially solving this 3 divided by the square root of, when we think about this, 1.333333 divided by 5 gets us 0 0.266. Repeating, we need the square root of 0.266666666 repeating to get us 3 divided by 0 0.516. Six, and we'll go ahead and round it off there at four. So now we have a test statistic of three divided by 0.5164 to get us 5.809. We were to look at this and now interpret it. We would sketch our little thing again, sketch our little distribution shade our critical regions, do our critical values of 3.77 and negative 3.77, 0 in the middle, 5.8 is not between negative 3.77 and 0, it's not between 0 and 3.77, it's to the right out here, and it falls inside of our critical region, and though, therefore we would reject the null hypothesis in this case. Now, that's one. Now we need to go through and do it for the other two possible comparisons, which will go pretty fast on your end. All right, so that's a lot of work. Now, most of it's actually unnecessary, and I'm going to point out why. You'll notice that our rejection criteria each time did not change. Our denominator each time did not change. The only thing that's changing is are different mean values. Now in this case actually for one of them it actually stayed the same. But the mean difference is the only thing that should change across runs. So there is a significant shortcut that you can end up taking. Specifically, and this is actually where I believe it gets its name, you can calculate what's called the honestly significant difference. My G's always end up looking like S's. And when you do it that way, what you're actually doing is you're algebraically rearranging things such that you take the critical value and then multiply it by what's essentially the air term in the t-test. 
So in this case, it would be Q crit times MS within, excuse me, times the square root of MS within divided by N. And then you would compare this honestly significant difference to each of the different mean values. So we're going to go through doing that. And this time, the calculations are much, much, much quicker. And you're not necessarily always going to write out the null and alternative hypotheses for each. So we're actually breaking with that way that we're doing it normally. But you would take your Q crit, which we know, since it always stays the same at 3.77, and multiply it by your MS within divided by your sample size. And this would be your HSD. So 3.77 times the square root of 1.33 repeating divided by 5 gets us 3.77 times the square root of 0.266 repeating. And then this would get us 3.77 times 0 0.5164. And this, in turn, should get us 1.94. So now we take this 1.94 and we compare it to each of the mean differences. So when we have sample 1 minus sample 2, sample 1 minus sample 3, and then sample 2 minus sample 3, we have 4 minus 1 to get us 3, 4 minus 1 to get us 3, and then 1 minus 1 to get us 0. And then we would compare specifically the absolute value of this mean difference to HSD. Because it could be a decrease that's statistically significant as easily as it could be an increase. So in this case, we are greater than 1.94, which is equal to HSD. So in this case, we reject H0. We're greater than again, so 1.94. Mean difference is greater than HSD, so we reject H0. And in this case, 0 is less than 1.94, excuse me, 1.94, which is equal to HSD. And so in this case, we fail to reject. So just to remind you, the decision rule is if the absolute value of your mean difference is greater than HSD, then reject your null hypothesis. All right, now notice that we're seeing a difference between samples 1 and samples 2, sample 1 and sample 3, but samples 2 and 3 are equal to each other. And if we look back, we got the same pattern of results when we did it all the way out, where we would reject. It's not reject again. They are significantly different, and then fail to reject when we're comparing 1 and 2, 1 and 3, and then 2 and 3. Now, this is great. We've interpreted it. We know what the significant mean differences are. Now we need to do some reporting. So in some cases and in some formats, you do have to go through and write up everything in this full way. However, most journals, and therefore in my classes, you do not have to do that for post-hoc tests. A p-value statement is sufficient. So is the mean significantly different? Yes or no, followed by a p is greater than or less than 0.05. So in this case, we're going to have to go through and go out. Now, we're going to have this up here for a little cheater sheet so we know what we reject and what we don't. And we're actually going to pull up our little table as well so we can keep track of what the different conditions are. Maybe. 
Let's see if I can get this to work. No, we just will have to remember. Oh well. All right, so the no phone condition. Condition resulted in significantly greater scores. Can'tly scores then both the handheld this point it's comma p is less than 0 0.05 and hands free p less than 0 0.05 conditions which were not different from each other which were not different from each other all right and so that's how you would report that note you're actually reporting three or excuse me four different tests you're reporting your f test your first postdoc test your second postdoc test and your third postdoc test for a total of four tests all right good luck um and have fun